Brace yourselves. 20 years ago today, April 18th, 2001, the original Desperados Wanted Dead or Alive was released. Welcome to our retrospective 20th anniversary review of Desperados 3. Yes, goosebumps. So before I get started, some real quick context. A few days ago, April 14th, I stumbled upon the release date of the first game in the series, Desperados Wanted Dead or Alive, which I'll be referring to from now on as simply Dead or Alive, and that release date was April 18th, 2001. So what better way to pay tribute to a youth-defining game for me than to throw together a really bulky review for the latest installment, Desperados 3, in order to celebrate the franchise's 20th birthday. I'm gonna go ahead and assume by clicking this video, you might have a grasp of what the Desperados franchise is about. If not, you and your gang of outlaws sneak through a wide array of captivating classic western settings, combining each character's unique set of skills to plow your way through an army of guards in the most gratifyingly gruesome way possible. Some consider it a chess-like puzzle game, while others define it as a real-time strategy stealth game. So. Do you have to have played the original game back in 2001 to enjoy this one? No. Do you have to have played the original to be able to put together a more well-nourished review of Desperados 3? No. Or maybe. We are aware there are numerous generally favorable reviews available on this game, while in this one we'll put a little twist on things. In this review, we'll shine our lights on Desperados 3 by putting it next to the classic first installment of the series. Desperados wanted dead or alive. Like their previous RTS title, Shadow Tactics, Blades of the Shogun, it's no secret Mimimi's Desperados 3 is foundationally influenced by the original Desperados game. As stated in a multi-part developer blog, the primary focus going into the development of Desperados 3 consisted of exploring what worked and how it worked in order to ultimately improve upon the classic RTS formula. There was nobody doing them anymore, so it was just kind of an urge to play those games and then you get the chance to like make a sequel or in this case a prequel that's just amazing we'll take the approach of well not comparing both games even though we'll be doing that quite a bit throughout this review but rather explore if desperados 3 is in itself a decent game and if and how it does justice to the soul of the first game and how it maybe even improves on it in the prequel. Yep, Desperados 3 takes place a couple years before Dead or Alive. As a fan of the original Desperados game, which was released almost 20 years prior to this latest release, I wanted this game to do well. You might even say I'm a little biased, or not. You know, loving a game that has such a special place in the very heart of your nostalgic memories tends to make me judge sequels, or prequels in this case, extra harshly to be honest. Especially knowing Desperados fans already had to endure two sequels that, you know, exist. Which path Hawkeye Wait, man speaks with? It's no secret that the previous two titles were all but satisfactory. By the way, it's easy to get confused. 2001 brought us dead or alive. Desperados 2 was released in 2006, and the following year we got to play Helldorado. So just when we thought things wouldn't ever get better than the original, in August 2018, THQ Nordic officially announced a game developed by Mimi Me, Desperados 3. So it makes sense to be a little thrown off by the title since it's actually the fourth installment of the game. Concerning spoilers, there's gonna be a lot of the original game in this one, and concerning spoilers for Desperados 3, expect to see a few levels that you normally only get to see towards the end of the main storyline, a few DLC levels, and a few, well, revealing words on the plot, if you can even call them that. I keep watching. What do you want? I want to solve your problem. So, just to refresh everyone's memory and to get the newcomers to the franchise up to speed, let's take a really quick look at the original game. As the premise is basically the same, main protagonists that make their return in this prequel are John Cooper, a bounty hunter who is quick on the draw, Kate, who can seduce enemies, and grumpy old Doc McCoy, who has a sniper, and is really ill-tempered. It's now or never. Even by only watching some of this old gameplay footage, 
A lot of Desperado's veterans will vividly remember all the things they so enjoyed about Dead or Alive. The amazing feel every mission has to it, thanks to the gorgeous levels full of details that really make each location breathe, accompanied by a very atmospheric and tense soundtrack. Lovable characters, whose skill set fit a sneaky playing style, but also allow you to go guns blazing if things go sour. The way you sometimes just kind of need to take a step back and study the way guards patrol their corners, while you indulge in this cheesy, cliched, yet nuanced and rich approach to the art direction of this game, leading you through towns, farms, fortresses, rocky deserts, all the classic spaghetti western stuff you can think of. The isometric camera cannot be turned, and adds to the feeling that really makes me want to spend time here to stroll around and wonder what's on the other side of that barn, church, or plantation. Like watching a painting, really. As a player, you could just sit back and wonder about little stories within the story, and what was actually going on in these levels behind the scenes. There's just so much this game got right, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Desperados 3 improves upon pretty much all of it. There just isn't really a whole lot of bad things to be said about this game. Pick her clean, boys. Take everything that shines and anything what could First of all, Desperados 3 looks gorgeous, and Mimimi doesn't pull any punches in showing off their adventurous level design right from the get-go. The way we get introduced to the game with this train level, as well as to main protagonist John Cooper, lets us know we're in for one hell of a ride. I wonder what's in here. <laughs> Something tells me you ain't here punching tickets. As a prequel, this game takes place six years prior to the original Desperados and evidently revisits some of the original mission locations or at least pay some kind of homage to them. Baton Rouge, for example, which we remember from the epic nighttime mission in Dead or Alive. This time the characters had a rough night before taking on the mission, and I'll leave it up to you to find out what that means exactly, but let's just say for now that it sprinkles more fun and humor on how we get to know the characters, and how you as a player are more closely witnessing the story. Kate, w wake up. Oh, God. My head's gonna burst wide open. Sure, <clears throat> sure thing. We need to talk, partners. Remember the before-mentioned stories within a story? Desperados 3 capitalizes on this big time. Take, for example, this mini-conversation situation between these guards and a couple civilians. Are you trying to mess or hit them bottles? Go find a mare and stick your head in someone else's ass, oh, Monday. Hell, I need new boots. Yeah, we're practicing here. Well, then be my guest. Practice makes perfect. Hey, how'd it go? Don't ask. However much cheesy these lines may be, these insignificant backstories make me remember how mesmerized I was by some of the Dead or Alive levels 20 years ago, and how for example, in the nighttime Baton Rouge level, I would always wonder what these guards were actually saying to each other, which ones were assholes, and how their day went. These backstories make all the difference in how alive a town felt. Which of you is tough enough to take on Bonebreaker? It would make some alleyways feel cozy, scary, or strangely erotic. Check out, for example, how in Desperados 3's flagstone level, these guys are digging a grave, or how you can use this facade on the construction site to take out a couple of enemies. The ability to turn the camera around, of course, adds to this element, so this time around, the game does allow you to check out what's on the other side of buildings. I also like how for different portions of a mission, I would turn the camera 90 degrees just to notice some stuff I hadn't seen in the previous camera angle. Quite the excitement. Let's blind him for a second. Best regards. Someone's about back in. 
Let's go. Considering the nature of this review, it only makes sense to also highlight just how much the graphics of Desperados 1 hold up, even in 2021. Going back to Dead or Alive feels like nothing more than blinking your eyes only to get a decent SD downgrade of today's standards, which is a good thing. Of course, I'm being very generous to the original game in saying that because character and NPC animations are far less impressive compared to today's Mimimi standards. But what about them gorgeous cutscenes that are alive had? This game had some top-notch cinematics. So much so that nearing the end of a mission, you'd already rub your hands in anticipation, wondering what story development you'd get to see this time. The intro cutscene had bullet time in it, which of course always made me think of The Matrix, a movie that pioneered that technique and was released only two years prior to Dead or Alive. Yep, at the time of doing this voiceover, The Matrix is nearing its 22nd birthday. I was really curious going into Desperados 3 if you'd get the same kind of cutscene treatment. However, all cutscenes are rendered in-game. Frank says he's getting impatient. Shh, not now. Can't you see we're in the middle of something? This isn't that disappointing, even though it would have added to the overall allure of Desperados 3. I'm guessing choices were made in this department and budget went to the production of an extra few announcement and launch trailers to get people up to speed about what Desperados is actually about, as the franchise was practically dead, knowing how it got butchered in previous iterations. Desperados is all about picking off guards one by one, or a whole bunch of them at the same time, and Desperados 3 really finds a very nice groove between the cemented rules this game has going for it gameplay-wise, and a very classy executed what-if attitude towards overall design. Take for example the way we get to still throw knives and go pick them back up, hide enemies in bushes, bear traps for unsuspecting guards to walk into, mixed with a voodoo-inspired mind-control character? This really shakes things up and will make you reconsider how you approach a situation just because it's more fun, intricate, and more gratifying than ever before. So let's talk a bit more about the bread and butter of the game. How does it play? I had my doubts going into the game on console, having spent so much time with the original game that only found its way to PC. Our playthrough was done on a PS4, while much of the recorded footage you'll be seeing was recorded on PC. It takes some getting used to, but ultimately most of the time I didn't even really remember I was holding a controller. Of course, dragging a rectangle around your characters and clicking their destination in order to see them run over there is less tedious than holding R1 to bring up the character select wheel, holding your stick towards the character you want to select, hit X to confirm selection, repeat for every character you want to select, manually make them run over there with the analog stick, only to almost reach your destination getting noticed without having quick save just to load your last save. But overall it's fine, and I wouldn't really know how to improve upon the control scheme, it's pretty good. If you take your time to really get to know the controls, you'll even start to enjoy them. However, if you want to go for competitive speedruns, which are also a part of the game, just type in Desperado Speedrun on YouTube, then you want to play this game with a mouse and keyboard. What makes Desperado so rewarding is that you probably will have failed a couple times before perfectly executing one or more guards. He's still shooting at us, damn fool! Quick saving is integral to the game, and even though some experience it as a hindrance... I'm sure that was a much easier solution than tweaking the difficulty that meant the developers could get down the pub quicker, but I don't really like trial and erroring my way through a game. It doesn't make me feel smart or powerful, and all suspense is lost. Ooh, can you succeed in this challenge using only your wits, your cunning, and your infinite zero consequence restarts? Yes, of course I fucking will, given enough time. I'm monkey typewritering this shit. It allows for more experimentation, though, and due to the cruel nature of the game... <laughs> It only feels right that you can stack three quick saves upon one another. 
Also in the first Desperados, you just as well might have taken a little nap every once in a while just to wait for a guard to patrol his entire block. Hurry up. Mother shall we? So the simple yet brilliant option to speed up the game is a welcome addition. What I find fascinating about Desperados is when you're playing the game, you're in charge of so much stuff that a lot of the time you'll be observing, studying, and plotting your next moves. Most of the time, you'll be aware of every guard within shooting distance, his or her patrolling routes, where they're looking at, and for how long. So much is going on that it's hard to, as a viewer or a buddy on the couch, follow along with what's going on. That's not at all meant to be a criticism, just an observation of how rich Desperados is gameplay-wise, because what you don't always get to see on the screen is how deep and intricate preparation for and execution of the next move can be. As an audience, you're basically cluelessly watching what's going on, missing half of the action, while as a player, you feel like a true Napoleon, the star of the show. I'm segueing, of course, into one of the core mechanics of the game, being showdown mode in which you can kind of freeze the game to plan or pre-program the most intricate way to make your team work together. It's done wonderfully well, and this is where Desperados 3 really takes a huge leap from its predecessor's quick action mode. I'll get to it. I could do this all day. Don't make a sound. Everything just feels so much smoother, better thought out and intricate that we've devoted a whole nother video to it on this channel. Please also check out some Mario Kart stuff, consider liking and subscribing, it means the world. For now I can only say that in the heat of the moment, inputting yet another ingenious showdown kind of feels like unholstering your gun, reaching into your pockets for the two bullets you have left, manually inserting them into your weapon while checking if Doc is ready to ride in time, snipe the other guard, walking into you shooting two other guards. Especially in the hardest difficulty setting, and with more actions of more characters going on at once, these situations will make you gasp for air and make you feel like a true Desperado's mastermind. Meanwhile, your buddy, spouse, kid, or father could be sitting on the couch, wondering what the hell just happened out of nothing. That being said, let's get in depth. Let's get into the nitty gritty. This is the rabbit hole. So in Desperados, you usually want to sneak your way through a level. At its most basic, truest core, you want to slit a guard's throat from behind while your buddy is distracting the other guard. Except you control both your characters, and there's five characters and a lot of guards. And they're all looking at each other, which is a lot of stuff to consider. I was 13 when I played the original, so I still had some kind of feel for the gameplay and overall moveset of the characters, and one of the things I was wondering about going into this game, how is Mimimi Mi going to teach Desperados to newcomers? How are they gonna make it click? I must say I was grinning at the screen a couple times when these basic mechanics were taught and characters were introduced. The way the game took trained players and newcomers by the hand was really satisfying to experience. I like to think the way the music evolves within a level also plays a huge part in this. Also, there's a couple of these little winks referring to the first game, which are really cool. On Go. Serving as an observation rather than criticism, throughout the game I got the feeling that whereas in Dead or Alive, where you were encouraged to step into a building every once in a while, Desperados 3's level structure and design explicitly shuts you out of buildings. Or maybe not in a few early levels, where the game is still warming you up in a tutorial kind of way. In fact, almost the only accessible indoor areas are reinforcement cabins with one door and guards in them. Dead or Alive had this great option to peek through every building's keyhole and scout if and how much guards a building consisted of. If you would enter a building containing four or more guards, they'd start shooting you and there was a short window of time to try to escape. If a building had two or three guards and you'd enter with big guy Sanchez, he would literally throw out the enemies, only for another one of your characters to tie him up so you could hide their bodies. Not bad! I can see you ain't lost your knack for climbing. The very first level in Dead or Alive had you shooting a flower pot on a windowsill. 
Only for what must have been an old flame of Cooper sticking her head out the window to invite him in. But I bet you can't shoot it down from here. How much? Whoever loses pays for the liquor. It's a deal. Here goes. Damn it! What nut is doing all the shooting around here? Yeah, in the name of all that's unholy! Is that you, John? Why don't you come up and see me sometime, sweetie? Thanks for the offer, maybe later. It's a fun little thing that would involve you more. Again, make you wonder about stories within the story. Even though these moments are scarce throughout the game, it would, right from the get-go, let you know there's people in these little houses you're looking at, whereas now I may sometimes feel left out of what's going on in a particular level. I may feel excluded or less involved in what I'm looking at. However, ultimately though, What's happening? because of this, the first game had this added layer of vague unpredictability or even random unfairness to it. In Desperados 3, what you see is what you get. All the positions of the enemies are revealed in the beginning of a mission, together with set reinforcement cabins that spawn guards if the alarm is sounded. In case of an alarm or you being detected, Dead or Alive would transform a focused army of carefully placed guards into a sprawling mess of ant-like swarming enemies. A swarming soldier soup, if you will. These situations could act as a quick fix when you got stuck, or when you get tired of doing things in a stealthy way, for you to quickly blast your way through the remaining guards, just presenting themselves, dumbfoundedly running at you. Not raising the alarm was kind of a self-instated mission objective. A badge of honor. You can, if something goes wrong, then just pull out your guns. And I think that worked out quite well. And it's different from how the old games handled it. Because in the old games, you could just start shooting and you just, the whole map started running towards you and you just killed everyone and then the mission was done. And that's not possible in our game because we balanced that a little bit. This balancing is done really well by dividing every level into zones guards won't leave. Agreed, you could say it diminishes the realism or the AI aspect. And you could wonder why enemy guards wouldn't be interested in clearly noticeable deadly conflict literally just a stone's throw away. It's not like they have more important stuff to attend to besides reacting to infiltrants. Just because they're on the other side of a fence or zone may feel a bit silly for them not to just run up to your gang. However, this doesn't bother me at all, and besides, this is the very issue that needed balancing out. A creative, far-reaching mind might even give this its own backstory, as in, these enemy cowboys were so committed to their job, they probably held meetings and follow-up meetings to draw up zones regarding when and when not to leave their post. Either way, Mimimi did a really great job at balancing the game, and pretty much each zone contains a suffice amount of guards to make you wonder how you'll get past this bunch this time. Hey, Daryl! Look what I found in the get weeds! Your fucking hands off me! Up until this point, I haven't talked much about the addition of one special character. One character whose skill set drastically and refreshingly alters the way in which you approach this game. Indeed, I'm talking about Hector. Just kidding. He's kind of a lovable replacement character for Dead or Alive Sanchez. I'm talking, of course, about Isabel. I don't want to dwindle on this for too long, since every review out there has done that before this one. However, the addition of her character is a really impactful one. At first, I thought of this as the new gimmick for reviewers to rave about. Isabel can mark two guards and connect them, and if you tickle one, the other guard will uncontrollably laugh as well. If by tickling you mean shooting in the face, and by uncontrollably laughing you mean dying a quick, horrible death. It's a fun thing to play around with, and I'd heard the developers talk about it in the blog, about how many more options this opens up to make your way through the game, and I'm pretty sure I haven't even scratched the surface of all the possibilities in my first playthrough. I may be blowing this out of proportion just a little bit, but the addition of Isabel might just be what Desperados, as a franchise, really needed to make the difference in a reshaped 2020 gaming landscape. Also, you can connect a guard to a dog or a chicken. Great stuff. I don't enjoy owing favors. Try it lighten up, sunshine. You in New Orleans. <sighs> Whatever. It's these kind of things that really make you feel the love that went into this game. Same thing with the backstory of the characters. 
Let's just say in Dead or Alive we got to know Cooper as the self-assured, reliable soldier. Let's quit all this pretty talk. Who's behind the train robbers around here? While Kate was a little naughty. Gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind. And Doc was just grumpy. That's kinda it, bluntly put. Mimimi really blew some life into these characters, and the fact that Desperados 3 takes place before Dead or Alive really makes for some surprising twists and turns. Without spoiling anything, of course, I always wondered when I was 13 how Cooper got to become Cooper. Was he always this heroic, even as a kid? And Kate and Cooper, come on, is something going on there? Doc, is he just a one-dimensional grumpy grandpa? What drives this guy? So, a feature no one was asking for and no one even knew they needed it is the replay. I must say I was kinda taken aback while writing this voiceover. The foundation of this channel, putting little arrows on Mario Kart circuits for training and entertainment purposes, closely resembles what the game does for you at the end of each level. Revisiting this hyperlapse kinda souvenir of your run is really satisfying. Again, you will remember everything and where it happened while anyone else will just see lines go crisscross in between red dots that keep dwindling in number. I'm starting to sound like a fanboy, and I might be, but this is so awesome. Then on to an aspect I was a bit disappointed by every once in a while throughout the game. What's that, buddy? Bless ya. Desperado's missions typically always alternate between a daytime and a nighttime level. It adds to the atmosphere of the game, and after spending a typical 1, 2, 3 hours per mission, depending on how much you want to take in the scenery, it kinda almost feels natural that it got dark outside once the level was completed. Dark outside means hiding spots. Which brings us to my actual topic of sadness. Considering the trademark atmosphere Desperados has going for it, I can't help but complain about the absence of meaningful or exciting ways to hide your characters in Desperados 3. In Dead or Alive, the dark corners during nighttime levels or countless buildings you could hide in felt a lot more authentic and tense than the standard bushes you get in Desperados 3. Yep, always, everywhere, time and time again, bushes. We actually counted all the hiding spots in the game, we didn't. 98% of them were bushes. Bushes. The other 2% consist of a little toilet and a haystack. I exaggerate, but you know what I mean, it's mostly bushes. Some off-the-cuff epic hiding spots in Desperados 1 were this saloon, this cozy cabin, this ship, this what I think must be a security check-in cabin granting you entry to the sheriff's domain, this place where I assume the guards had lunch, this forest where every shadow or hiding spot felt like it had its own little feel to it. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess these bushes make sure that every hiding spot I don't know if reacts in the same way, or maybe it serves a functionality purpose. My point is, because of the lack of different hiding spots and overall accessibility to buildings, in order to fit into the clear and concise way Mimimi wants you to approach gameplay for Desperados 3, to me it kind of feels like a minor dissonant note, a missed chance to truly breathe in these levels. Which, to be clear, doesn't mean level design isn't top notch in this game. One thing I like is during the first playthrough, a lot of levels make you explicitly choose what integral part of a map you want to skip. Or rather, which insanely guard sprawled route you do want to take the first time around to complete a mission. The classical horse with these uh, coconut shells, you know, walking from sand. So despite a few annoyances, oh man, does this game make up an enthusiasm, creativity, and frankly, pure fun it has going for it. Being able to to have the, the courage to say, okay, let's just put in a hurdy-gurdy or let's put in much more synthesizer than, you know, not just a subtle synthesizer that somebody could say, oh, maybe it's like somebody falling on a guitar, so it's cool <laughs> for Western or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but something that's really iconic to the game. So in the river level, we, we meet uh, um, Isabel Mo for the first time. And there's a, a moment where the, the hurdy-gurdy is really prominent. Swamp witches. All right. How about it? You gonna put a spell on me? Where the first game had kind of a tense, doom and gloom, movie, action sequence vibe to it, alternating between green, 
Yellow. Wow, I'm dying. And red. Look over there. It's now or never. Desperados 3 doesn't completely abandon this concept. The music will still let you know when something is up, but rather builds onto that with synergetic crescendos that reflect mission situations in a really nice way. And I also can't help but think some exotic instrumental riffs are inserted every once in a while when you successfully pull off a showdown. A little musical comment, if you will. Also really noteworthy is how the main storyline is capped off with a brilliant way of inserting a live reprise of a soundtrack that by then has already imprinted its instant classic motifs in your brain. So the soundtrack of Desperados 1 and 3 differ radically, yet serve their era and installment of the franchise well, so kudos to the audio lead for the playfully unpretentious yet ambitious take on this aspect of the game. Unpretentious is also the adjective that comes to mind and how the approach to the plot feels, by which I mean that despite one plot twist that had me going, what? You won't have that much trouble predicting or even accepting that ultimately a couple of good guys are gonna shoot the bad guy. It's an excellent script for this game to be written to and vice versa. And it fits perfectly the way our characters interact and the cheesy way Italo Westerns are referenced or played with, just like its predecessor. Remember Dead or Alive had hilarious on-the-nose one-liners such as It's been a pleasure, Marshal. Not bad, huh? What you reckon, Smith? What would you do for a fistful of dollars? Huh, Smith? What would you do? Talking about one-liners, every Desperados enthusiast will tell you about the legendary lines characters would utter when you'd select them. I smell trouble. Do I have to wait forever? Mm. These are back, with different voice actors, and even though it takes just a little getting used to, the new voices will probably make you wonder how their old counterparts sounded like, which is an accomplishment in itself. Let's keep moving. Even if it's just because, as in Dead or Alive, you'll be hearing them a lot. Let's make this interesting. In my opinion, Desperados 3 could have ended by wrapping up the main storyline, and that would have been perfectly fine. After all, as before mentioned, after a first completion, there's still a vast amount of unexplored terrain for you to sneak through, along with challenges and speedrun badges to collect within the main storyline. But me, me, me didn't stop there. Once you've completed the campaign, there's another whole bunch of reiterations of levels with custom and playful objectives known as the Baron Challenges. It's in these extra quests the developers love for the game and the what-if approach once again seeps through. How about you can move through an entire map of guards that won't shoot you? Unless... What if your objective was to carry an unconscious body from one end to the map to the other without them noticing? Or how about a Where's Waldo level? Once again, the humor and overall coziness Mimimi has sprinkled all over this game is very nuanced, unpretentious, and true to the core of what Desperados wanted Dead or Alive had to offer 20 years ago. Add to that a legit priced 3 extra missions DLC, including a fan favorite mission from the old game, and you've got yourself a killer RTS game. That's it, thank you so much for watching, see you later in a totally unrelated video. Sometimes I get to thinking that my life might...